today's uh, discussion would be very different than yesterday's uh, in the following sense. So yesterday I discussed some a list of problems uh, which were, uh, let's say, open for a while. Uh, and now there are some new techniques that allow to solve them. Today what I'm going to do is to talk about a problem that is interesting for a while and there is not much progress, but there are some hints that one can make progress. And so I would just like to explain the subject a little bit and why I think one can make progress. And then maybe some of you will be able to push it forward and see how much, how much further we can go. Also, it's an interesting subject on which there are already partial results. And these partial results may be interesting in their own right. So let me start by quickly reminding you about what happens if you study uh, young Mills theory at large n. So there is no, I'm not talking about some supersymmetric theory. I'm talking about ordinary SUN uh, young Mills theory, which uh, is known uh, to confine. So this theory confines. Uh, there is a mass gap. Okay. Uh, so there is so, so the spectrum of the theory. If this is a, the mass squared axis, there will be some a global. So this would be zero. There are no massless particles. This theory confines. Uh, so there would be some global at some mass lambda, and then there would be many other states. There would be many other resonances in this theory. Uh, and phenomenologically, we know that these other resonances are unstable particles that can decay to the lightest globals with the right quantum numbers. But one result that is of uh, importance is that if you take the limit of n going to infinity, then all these resonances, at least phenomenologically, they become exactly stable. So the resonances become exactly stable. And a related fact, a related fact is that uh, the three-point functions of resonances are very, very small. And that's why their decay probability uh, goes to zero at the large end limit. So let's say the amplitude for some resonance to go to some other two resonances goes like one over n squared in canonical, when everything is canonically normalized. Then this is the right answer. And so the decay probability goes to zero. And what you get phenologically is a bunch of stable resonances with some masses n and some coupling constants that characterize how resonances interact with each other. And these coupling constants are small. They're 1 over n squared, which means that the resonances are stable. I just wanted to, uh, in five minutes, to review the argument for why you get infinitely many stable resonances, and then talk about how could we possibly try to understand the, if there is an internal structure in the spectrum of resonances. So the problem that I would like to discuss, this problem would not have an answer in the end of the lecture. So unlike the three previous lectures where I posed the problem and in the end I solved it, uh, in this problem I would not solve it. Uh, there would be only very partial results, but I think uh, maybe they can be pushed further. So the problem is to determine Pn. Okay, to determine these uh, uh, masses. Uh, so we can call them mn squared, maybe more physically. Determine the masses of this resonance squared, <coughs> of these exactly stable resonances. Since they're exactly stable, then these numbers make sense. It's some mathematical series of numbers, and uh, it makes sense to ask what, what they are. Now, even partial results uh, could be interesting. For example, if you could show, one of the things that you could try to show is that asymptotically, Uh, mn squared looks like some a n plus b. So this is one uh, conjecture that you could try to prove, that as n going to infinity, 
these resonances sit on a straight. The resonances sit on a straight line, uh, at least the resonances, the resonances with the highest spin. At least those, at least so we can say that this would, we could at least expect that this is true, at least for those MN that correspond to maximal spin. I'll explain what I mean by that. So those particles that spin very, very fast could sit on a straight line. And that intuition kind of follows if you believe in the string picture. That uh, at least in some naive string pictures, you would expect that there would be asymptotically linear uh, trajectories of particles. Uh, okay, so there are some things of that sort that you could try to show. And in fact, it's a, uh, I mean, this, there is a lot of data in this science. There is lots of Monte Carlo simulations of large and young Mills theory, and people have gone pretty far. Uh, we have lots of data about the low lying resonances, some partial data about high resonances. And so if you can make concrete, concrete predictions about this theory, then it would be very worthwhile. Uh, there would be many people who could contrast your predictions with experiment, I mean Monte Carlo simulations, and there may also be connections to string theory and so on. Okay, so anyway, that's the problem that uh, I would like to discuss. I just want to start with some reminder of the large n limit, of how we take the large n limit. That's just for the beginner students among you that haven't seen it. So the idea is that you take g and mills to zero and n to infinity in such a way that the combination g and mills squared n is kept fixed. Now, this makes sense. Uh, this makes sense because let's recall the beta function. The beta function for g and mills it looks like uh, g young mills cube times uh, n squared. So uh, plus higher order corrections. Let, let me see. Yeah, so this is G squared. And this is right. So uh, this, is the, this is the one loop beta function of Young Mills theory. Now let's multiply it by another G Young Mills. So we get squared. And here we get to the power 4. Now we multiply it by n. And we have n here and n squared here. And so we see that for the cup for this for this finite combination g squared lambda oh, sorry for this finite combination g squared n which is called lambda the beta function doesn't have factors of n so we have lambda cubed oh, sorry we have lambda squared plus higher order corrections these higher order corrections are functions of lambda and there are terms which are 1 over n times lambda so these higher order corrections could be lambda cubed, lambda to the four, but they could also be one over n times lambda cubed, and so on. Okay? So these corrections would be uh, small if lambda is small, and they, there would be also corrections that die, off, that die away when n is taken to infinity. Famously, the sign here is negative, of course. <clears throat> and so uh, what this beta function says is that uh, uh, the lambda explodes at some scale. So if this is the energy scale, and uh, if this is lambda, if you start off from some small lambda at very high energies, it would naively explode at some scale. At least this is the, what the leading term predicts. Of course, we can't trust the leading term near where it explodes, but it doesn't matter. This theory clearly flows to strong coupling. It confines, and so, the large n limit in this way where g squared times n is kept fixed is a good limit because in this limit you expect confinement with the resonances having finite mass which is independent of n. So, they, so because of this property that the beta function doesn't depend on n, you would expect that the resonances, the resonances of, Q, the resonances of Young-Mills theory that we've 
uh, observed in Monte Carlo simulations and even in some sense in nature, the resonances of this Young Mills theory uh, would stay the masses, the masses of these resonances, the masses of these resonances in Young Mills theory would stay finite in this la larger, larger limit. That's because strong coupling, the strong coupling dynamics kicks in at some fixed energy scale that doesn't scale with n to leading order. Okay, so you expect that these resonances would stay at some would have some finite masses in the large n limit. Furthermore, you expect that their couplings would be one over n, simply because uh, the you know if you j just draw a diagram of three resonances. So let's assume we have three mesons, or well, let's say three globals. We're just doing Young Mills theory. If we try to draw a diagram of three globals, then uh, this is of order n squared, just because we have this, uh, you know, two loops here. This is how it, this, that kind of diagram would look like in the large n limit, in the Tooth notation. So there would be two loops here, and you would get a factor of n squared. But the propagators are also uh, of order n squared. So the two-point functions of, are of order n squared. But also the three-point functions, let's say of globals. I keep, I keep writing mesons, but I mean globals. So the two-point functions of globals and the three-point functions of globals scale like n squared. And so if you just canonically normalize, canonically normalize the, the two-point functions to be one, therefore you divide f squared by n, then you get uh, that the canonically normalized three-point function the canonically normalized three-point function would look like one over n. I meant here the amplitude squared. Yes. But yeah, yeah, there could be. They would be one over n squared in general. <coughs> so we have a. So the canonically normalized three-point functions go like one over n, and the canonically normalized uh, four-point functions go like one over n squared, and that's how that's how it goes. So higher correlation functions are more and more suppressed when they're canonically normalized. And so you can think about this theory, at least at large n, as a bunch of mesons with very, very, sorry, bunch of globals with very, very weak interactions. Uh, and the mesons are almost stable because the interactions are so weak that the probability of decay uh, goes like one over n squared. So therefore, you can imagine that at infinite n, there is some effective Lagrangian for globals. So you could imagine that there is a bunch of globals, G and with various spins. Okay? So there could be rotating globals, there could be spinless globals. And they have some kinetic terms, which are normalized, some, like something of this sort, very schematically. There could be, they, they could be spinning particles. They would be massive, so all of them would be massive. So the mass of the global n with spin s, you can denote by m and s squared. And then there are weak interactions which could possibly connect any three globals. You know, uh, the only constraint being Lorentz invariance. And there could be derivatives in these interactions. They don't have to be uh, so simple. There could be various derivatives at various points with some powers. But these interactions would be one over n suppressed. And then there could be four-point functions, you know, with g, 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 and so on. So at infinite n, we expect the theory to basically consist of uh, infinitely many globals with various spins. So we expect the theory to consist of infinitely many globals with various spins uh, and various masses, various coefficients for three-point interactions four-point interactions, and so on. Uh, this is the leading interaction. This is somehow, in some sense, smaller. If you want to compute four-point functions of globals, let's say you want to compute a four-point function, 
then you can either exchange a resonance like this, or you can just pick a contact term from here. They would be both of order one over n squared. Uh, but you don't need to care about higher order terms because they would be further uh, suppressed. Okay, so this is just a reminder about the, the phenomenology of large n that we expect a bunch of uh, globals you know, with various masses and spins. Now, uh, one, interesting, one interesting observable that emerged in the 60s is uh, a relation between the masses of these globals and there's, are there any questions? Yes. The width of the resonances goes like one over n squared. Right. It also scales like the energy in units of No, this, this scaling doesn't scale with n. This, this part doesn't scale with n because the masses are finite as. I suppose I think the energy to be some power of n. At some point, the Ah, yeah. I mean, uh, if you, I mean, th there is a series of globals with various masses and spins. And uh, we don't consider these masses to be so high that they are of order n. For us, n is the largest parameter. And we just care about you know, the low-lying, the globals that are not that massive that are comparable with n. Let's say if n is 100, we care about the first 100 globals. But I want an estimate for how, long, how far we can go before they start becoming very wide. Uh, that's a, a good question. I wouldn't be able to give you an answer right away. Yeah. But indeed, uh, for high enough masses, you would expect that the phase space would be so huge uh, that they could decay to so many particles that. You might think it's an exponential. Yes, yes, it could be an, even an exponential. <laughs> Uh, it depends on the density of states. It depends on how, how much phase space you've got to decay to. Indeed, it's an interesting question you could try to solve. Uh, okay, so some interesting uh, thing that emerged in the 60s, I think it's called something like the chui farucci plot. I'm not if I'm exactly even sure how to spell it. Uh, but it's a diagram where you plot, you plot the mass squared as a function of spin, okay? So we have a bunch of particles with various spins. And for a given, a given spin, there could be uh, many particles of that spin. However, it turns out, so let's start from spin zero, one, two, and so on. However, it turns out that it's interesting to consider for a given spin, you could try to consider uh, let me just do it the opposite. It would be uh, slightly nicer. So this would be. So for each particle, you could try to consider, for each mass, you could try to consider the, 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 the particle that spins the fastest with that mass. OK. And so what people have found is that at least in QCD, this kind of spectra can be approximated by straight lines, and then there are subleading straight lines. So to, to, some phenological, to some phenological approximation, it seems that these resonances lie on straight lines, approximately straight lines. Of course, in real life, these resonances are wide, and you can't even place exactly where they sit. But it seems to, that to some precision, they sit on straight lines. Were these lines not for This would be for globals. Let's, this is the mass squared uh, of globe. This is the mass squared. So the, the, these lines are straight in the plane S M squared. And these mass squares are for globals. And this came from experiments? This came from Monte Carlo. For me, Monte Carlo and experiment is the same thing. They have a statistic. When you have errors, it's experiment. <laughs> but uh, it's also true for mesons. It's also, uh, in, for mesons, it's a, fact of, it's, a, it's a fact that you can see in nature. Uh, that it seems to be well approximated by straight lines. For globals, it comes from Monte Carlo simulations, uh, where people have gone pretty far, uh, both in four and three dimensions, especially the group of Tepper. So if you want to look at the data, you should look up paper, papers by Michael Tepper. He has, gone, he has done amazing work in three and four dimensions simulating these globals for a bunch of gauge theories. And he has these plots, and you can see that things line up extremely nicely. In fact, it's so good that one can, can't even, with the naked eye, see differences between what he finds and exactly straight lines, which is somewhat mysterious. But anyway, one expects this kind of analogy. So for a given spin, you would eventually expect that there would be infinitely many particles of the same spin 
or a given mass, you would expect that there would be a maximal spin, a maximal spin for which there would be finitely many particles, and there would be a maximal spin that a particle of that mass can have. But for a given spin, you expect infinitely many particles. So that's what we expect from large end physics. We expect that for a given spin, there would be infinitely many particles. For a given mass, there would be finitely many particles with a maximal spin. And I think that there is an expectation that perhaps these lines are not exactly straight. There could be some, uh, some interesting curves. But I think there is a reasonable expectation that they at least asymptotically look linear as, a statement about, uh, as an exact statement about large n. There is a long debate about that in the literature. There is sort of a proof that they have to be exactly straight by Mandelstam. Uh, just a, a, his quick, a quick historical overview. So Mandelstam uh, came up with an argument that's it's called the Mandelstam argument. I won't review the argument. <coughs> it requires a little bit too much background, but Mandelstam had an argument to the effect that these lines are exactly straight at large n. Uh, this argument, I think, uh, is known to be false. In fact, um, from ADS-CFT, uh, we have examples of large n theories that can be solved via the ADS dual. And deviations from straight lines have been observed. So people have seen that these lines, if they, you can analytically continue them to a negative m squared, and they don't look straight. They look something like this. So this is polchinski strassler So if you look up in the polchinski strassler papers, you will see that in their example, they have a controlled regime where they could compute these lines, and you'll see deviations from straight lines. Small deviations, they are asymptotically linear in polchinski strassler but uh, they're not exactly linear. So I think that the Mandelstam argument is clearly wrong, and if you look at the argument, I, should, I can send you the link if you send me an email, you will, you'll be able to see that there is an assumption that is most likely false. There is an, an, an implicit assumption. But I think that uh, uh, there is no reason not to expect that these lines do become asymptotically linear uh, at large mass squared, at least for the leading guy. These subleading lines may or may not exist in large NQCD. I, I don't know. It's hard to say what happens to these subleading lines, but at least for the leading line, I think that there is a good expectation that they would be asymptotically linear. And the question is, can we, can we prove it or understand why this has to be true? This is, like, in some sense, showing that there is a string, that indeed in four-dimensional uh, young milster there is a hidden string, this string description of some sort, that uh, this is the sort of thing that you would expect from a string description. Now, of course, due to the, after the ads CFT correspondence, we learned that this string description might not be a string in flat space. It might be a string in ADS, and expectations from strings in ADS might be different from the expectations from strings in flat space. But having said all that, it seems that in all the known examples, it is asymptotically linear. So it's still asymptotically linear in all the known examples, even in those that have been studied using the ideas of ads CFT. Yes? Is it well, I, my, for me, capital N is always the largest parameter. So once N is a very large parameter, you have lots of resonances to study before these issues that Shiraz mentioned become important, like before they become wide. There are lots of very stable resonances to study at large N. And so uh, you can discuss what happens when the mass squared is large, but not so large that it would be of order capital N. It's a completely completely well-posed question. Roughly speaking, you would expect that when the mass squared becomes of order n times the QCD scale, which is finite, maybe things would break down. But if n is very large, you have like a thousand resonances to study. Or if n is a million, you have a million resonances to study. And so, and so uh, this question makes complete mathematical sense. And it's also something that can be settled with future Monte Carlo simulations that would go further than uh, before. Now they're at spin, I think that they can go up to spin eight or 10, but it's completely reasonable that with the advent of computing and maybe even other methods, they could go even further.
And so this question is something that will be settled in the future. Okay. Any other questions? Now I'm going to describe some way to think about these questions, which uh, allows you to prove two things. So what I'm going to do, to do now is that I'll set up a certain framework that uh, allows you to study these resonances. And I will prove for you two results. This, these are not results about asymptotic linearity, but these are nevertheless two results that uh, are correct. And maybe this can be pushed further. So uh, the first result that I'll prove is that there have to be infinitely many resonances. There have to be infinitely many resonances at large n, where n is the biggest parameter. And the fact, second result is that for every spin, for every spin, there must be infinitely many resonances. Okay? So these are some results in uh, some well-defined mathematical framework that you can prove. And it begins to sound like some sort of Hagedorn density of states, uh, uh, linear trajectories, but these are speculations. These things are pretty easy to prove, but I think that the framework is so constrained that it's obvious that you can go much further. It's just that it hasn't been done yet. So what's the framework? The framework is the S matrix. So the S matrix bootstrap, all right? So it's very similar to what you heard about in the context of conformal field theories. So I'll define the problem of the S matrix bootstrap. It's a well-defined problem in mathematics. Uh, and at some point, you can forget about the underlying physics. It becomes a completely well-defined problem in mathematics. And one of the first consequences that you can prove one, well, the two first consequences that you can easily prove are these two. So I'm going to define what I mean by the S matrix bootstrap program. Uh, this program has not been as successful as the CFT bootstrap program, but it might be as successful in the future. There is no reason why not. <clears throat> so the idea is that we study two to two scattering. We study two to two scattering of the lightest global, okay? You could study any other, you could pick other states, it doesn't matter. We, so we studied two to two scattering. It's a, an exclusive scattering amplitude. So the out states are the same globals that went in, but they can be with other momenta. So there would be P1, P2, P3, P4. And these are the same globals, uh, so PI squared is given by some uh, m naught squared. This is the mass of the lightest global. And since this is 2 to 2 scattering, this is of order 1 over n squared. Okay? So this amplitude is small. Most of the time, these globals would just fly across each other because it's a large n theory. So this amplitude is small, but we're going to subtract the component which describes the process in which they just fly through each other. And we're going to concentrate on the actual scattering amplitude. So the actual scattering amplitude is a function of two complex variables, S and T. S is defined to be P1 plus P2 squared. And T is defined as P1 minus P3 squared. Let me just uh, make sure that these are the same conventions that I, I have in my notes. Yeah. Okay. There is a third variable that you could define, which is called u, which is p minus p1 minus p4 squared, but it's redundant because this is minus t minus s a plus a four times m naught squared. You can just check that uh, by momentum conservation, and so, so since there is momentum conservation, and since each of the p squareds is m naught squared, this is a linear combination of this and that. Okay, so this is, this is a check you can do. Now, in the center of mass, you can view this process in the center of mass, where P1 comes from here, the P1, P2 comes from here, 
So in the center of mass, these momenta are the same. In the center of mass, the spatial momenta are opposite to each other, and the energies are the same. And they collide here. And then some particles fly out. Okay, this is the center of mass picture, in which P2 is almost the same as P1. P1 would have a momentum to the left, and P2 to the right. And they have the same energy. And then they fly out, and you can define an angle theta with which they fly out. The process has an azimuthal symmetry, so it doesn't depend on the angle on the cylinder, but it depends on theta. So you can define the angle theta, and you can just do a small computation and show that this is 1 plus 2t over s minus 4m naught squared. Okay, so this is the cosine of the angle of scattering. So if t vanishes, if t vanishes, then we're talking about forward scattering, where theta vanishes. And this also defines the physical regime. So I allowed these parameters t and s to be two complex parameters, but there, is some, there are some configurations for these parameters that don't describe any physical process. You see that uh, this has to be, for this angle to be real, this object has to be between 1 and minus 1. So that means that if s is bigger than 4m squared, this has to be negative. So there are some configurations of parameters that describe physical processes. There are some configurations that describe unphysical processes. And so uh, we do some analytic continuation. So these processes make sense for some t and s, and then we just analyt analytically continue this to be a function of two complex variables. Yeah, so I'm assuming, I'm assuming that the lightest, thanks Shiraz, he asks questions to which he knows the answer so that I uh, would tell you. So I'm, yeah, I'm indeed assuming that these lightest uh, particles are, are scalar. So the lightest globals are scalar. This is known from Monte Carlo simulations. The lightest global is a scalar. And where have I used that? I have used that in assuming that there is an azimuthal symmetry. If these particles carried spin, then there would not be an azimuthal symmetry. And the process would depend not just on theta, but also on phi. It would be more complicated. Uh, but in this way, it's very simple. OK, so now we have this function A, S of t, A of S and t, and it has to satisfy some axioms. And I'm going to list now the axioms that they have to, this function has to satisfy. Uh, and then you have to look for functions that satisfy these kind of things. So remember that this function a is of order 1 over n squared. So this function is always of order 1 over n squared in the large n limit. Which, and I'm going to throw away this factor of 1 over n squared because it's an overall factor. It won't be important for me. So I'm going to list all the axioms that this function has to satisfy. First of all, it has to be symmetric in its two variables. Why? This is what's called crossing symmetry. It's very much like in CFT. I mean, it, you can choose to look at this process from this point of view, but you can also choose to look at this process from this point of view. They are the same by, by analytic continuation because these are the same particles. If they were different particles, it would not hold. But since these are all the same particles, you can just move this state. You can just think about this state as an out state and about this state as an in state by flipping some signs. And the amplitude has to be the same. So A S of t is the same as A t of s. And this is the analog of the bootstrap equation that, uh, allow, that, that comes from the associativity of the operator product expansion. That's one constraint. That's an easy constraint to satisfy. You can write lots of symmetric functions. That's not an interesting. Uh, now let's fix t. Let's fix t for a second. And then we have a function of one complex variable. This function uh, of one complex variable uh, is a meromorphic function. So it's a meromorphic function uh, with certain poles. Uh, the poles are when there are particles that can be exchanged. So the poles correspond to uh, exchanging some of the heavier resonances. So we have our light global outside, but here there could be any resonance. 
m squared n of s. You could exchange resonance with spin and some mass, uh, and there will be some coefficients for the interactions here. These coefficients are of order one over n times some pure number. We throw away the factor of one over n squared. We just keep the pure numbers. So uh, there would be pulse uh, to these meromorphic functions, uh, to this meromorphic function uh, when s hits m squared n uh, spin. So let me now denote the spin by L because S uh, stands for something else. So whenever S hits one of those numbers, you get a pole. Okay. Uh, now, now, in some applications of this problem, like in string theory, some of the M squares are not actually positive, like there could be tachyons. That's one example that I'll analyze. But you know, in young mills theory, we expect all of these things to be positive. So the poles would only be on the positive axis, positive real axis. Now, away from the real axis, this function cannot have any singularities. There cannot be poles. There cannot be branch cuts. It's a meromorphic function. And the only poles are here. OK? Sorry, what? Yeah, I'm a, uh, forget about the U channel. I'm simplifying it a little bit. Forget about the U channel poles. But they exist. Yeah, yeah, but we forget about them. Yeah, it's a, it's, it's, it doesn't change anything. We just assume that it's a function of two variables and the poles are just here for fixed t. What, what Shiraz is saying is that there could be also poles on the negative axis due to u channel. There will be, yeah, but a, you can forget about it. It doesn't change anything. Uh, it's just a technical complication. Okay, so, uh, so there, there, are, there are poles at these points. And now comes the most important constraint. Now, these two constraints are natural for mathematicians. I mean, they have studied functions of that sort. But now comes a constraint which is uh, kind of pesky from the mathematical point of view. Uh, and this constraint, maybe I'll write it on this board so it would be more visible. This is the hardest constraint to satisfy. It leads to lots of interesting consequences. And it's not very natural mathem mathematically, which is why, I mean, you can't just go and open some book in complex analysis and read out the properties of these functions. So the hardest constraint, constraint comes from unitarity. Okay. So on the, on the one hand, you would think that unitarity poses no constraints at large n, because the amplitudes for scattering are so small that the probabilities are always much smaller than one. So the probability for scattering would never exceed one. Right? And that's correct. But still, unitarity imposes some non-trivial constraints because what it says is that this coupling times this coupling is positive. Because we have the same particles here as here, and we exchange some resonance. The coefficient that comes with this resonance must be positive because the coupling here and the coupling here is the same. So it's exactly the same sort of uh, constraint that you've seen in the CFT bootstrap program, where the coefficients of uh, conformal blocks were positive. So here the coefficients of resonances are positive, yes? So here the coefficients of these resonances have to be positive. And what it means is that if you look at the residue, so let's look at the residue of this function A of S and T. And for fixed T, we look at the residue near S equals M squared N S. So we just look at the residue that corresponds to one of the resonances. So this has to be a positive definite sum of Legendre polynomials, of, gener of, well, more generally, Gegenbauer polynomials. So it has to be a positive definite sum. Let's do four dimensions. So I'll just stick for a second three plus one dimensional physics. So this, then these Gegenbauer polynomials are just Legendre polynomials. Uh, so you have to have something like, you should be able to decompose the residue as a sum of Legendre polynomials of theta where theta was defined there. So cosine theta is one plus two t, but now we're looking at the residue, so we can replace the s, s in the denominator of cosine theta by uh, m squared uh, n l, so this was l and l, minus four times m naught squared. So uh, this, this, this formula looks a little bit weird, 
uh, if you assume that these masses are completely distinct, that all the masses are completely distinct, then the residue would be just one Legendre polynomial with a positive coefficient that corresponds to this particular guy. So it will be just PL. So this index here tells you about the spin. So, so there could, if there are degeneracies, then a certain pole in the S channel would encompass lots of resonances of different spins if there are degeneracies. And then you would have a sum over Legendre polynomials where this index runs over all the possible spins that sit at that mask word. But if there are no degeneracies, there would be just one Legendre polynomial. And the important constraint is that these coefficients have to be non-negative. Okay, this is what unitarity implies at large. Ed. Not more, nothing more, nothing less. If you satisfy these constraints, then you have a good uh, scattering amplitude. Does, yeah. Does unitarity also, <laughs> unitarity or causality or something also give you some, uh, how fast this amplitude dies off with energy as well? Yeah, we'll, we'll discuss that in a second. Are, are there any other questions about the... Uh, that? Okay. So you have to find solutions to this problem, um, which consists of three different constraints. Uh, one well-known solution uh, is what string theory gives, na namely the Veneziano amplitude, which I'll discuss a little bit uh, in a few minutes. But uh, I just want to uh, discuss a little bit the general consequences of these three different constraints. Okay, so one technical comment. One technical comment. This is something that one has to uh, realize is that, in fact, it's easy to construct amplitudes that satisfy these three different constraints. Here is an example. So you could have one pole here at M0 and one here. That's it. So this is a good solution to the whole pro to this problem. Why? It's obviously symmetric. It's obviously meromorphic when you fix T or S, and the residue at the pole for fixed T is just one, and one is a good Legendre polynomial with a positive coefficient. So this is an example of a solution. But the problem with this thing is that uh, for any fixed T, for any T, A S going to infinity T is uh, non-zero. So this is order one. So this amplitude does not decay for any t. So this is a cheap solution. It's unphysical. Uh, the physically interesting solutions to this problem have another, yet another constraint, which I'll write and then I'll take the question. So there is some, there should be some t naught, or maybe many t naughts, uh, for which a s t naught would go to zero as s going to infinity. Okay. And then now the combination of all of these constraints is extremely hard to solve. You wouldn't be able to guess a function that satisfies all of them. It's extremely hard to solve, and in fact, we just know we know that Young Mills should solve this, and we know that many other gauge theories at large and should solve these four constraints. String theory solves these four constraints, but we can't write functions that do that, except for one example. Yes? So we do some analytic continuation. There is the physical sheet, which is the space of configurations for T and S which describes actual physical processes. And there is then the rest, which is an analytic continuation. Yeah, it's just con obtained from the physical sheet by analytic continuation. <laughs> yeah, okay, uh, I'll explain where does this con condition come from. So this condition cannot be derived rigorously. Uh, this condition uh, comes from looking at the, all the known examples that emerge from the ADS-CFT correspondence and from experimental and, and in extrapolating wildly experimental data. 
Uh, this condition has something to do with asymptotic freedom. So if you are happy with arguments of the sort that a BFKL has to be right and therefore, I mean, something follows, then you could argue that that is true. In fact, you could argue there is a very nice argument that, uh, that if you assume asymptotic freedom, the trajectories cannot be exactly linear. Because BFKL, for some negative t, forces it to curve. And so if you are, you could, you could say that this is a property of asymptotically free theories. It's definitely satisfied in string theory. Uh, this is just a mathematical condition. There is some t naught. Typically, this t, typically t naught is negative. Typically, the t naught that you need is negative to satisfy that. Uh, this is not. This doesn't have to be some physical process that has some meaning. It's just a property of this analytic function that is needed for consistency. For it, it, it's needed for like if you have asymptotic freedom, then you need to impose it. Uh, in string theory, it follows. If you look at other examples that emerge from the idea CFT correspondence, then it's true. It's a condition that is basically meant to eliminate these cheap examples that don't describe physical situations. It could be. You could try to prove it. It, it, it's, not, it's not unfeasible that it can be proved, but here I'm just imposing it as an axiom. Okay, now from these four conditions, uh, you can prove a lot of things. Uh, you can prove that there are infinitely many resonances for every spin. Uh, that's what I want to do. And then we'll discuss one example, and I'm running out of time. So I'll just give you the argument that there must be infinitely many poles, okay? So let me just prove that there are infinitely many poles, and you'll prove at home that for every spin, there are infinitely many poles. Yes? Say again? You, you said the pole in you? Yeah, that's, uh, so I throw, I threw away all the U channel poles. Um, this is not something crazy to do because you can arrange for you can arrange for a scattering process in which the T and S channels are the same, but the U channel is different, and it may not even have any poles. It's a, it's a self-consistent thing to do to throw away this U channel pose. It's it's something that is good to do for simplicity. It doesn't change anything. It's something that I'm doing just for simplicity, so that the poles are on the positive axis. We don't have to worry about poles on the negative axis. It's just simpler. But it doesn't change any of the qualitative conclusions. Okay, so here I'll give you an example of how an argument could, you could you know, devise an argument that would prove that under these restrictions, there must be infinitely many resonances. And then you can try to quantify how big is this infinity? Do we get Huggett during density? And so on. So this, 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 could start, this could be the beginning of a systematic mathematical analysis of which functions satisfy that. Okay, so I'm going to do a five minutes of the technical proof proof of infinitely many resonances. Okay, so how would the argument go? It's, a it's an argument from complex analysis. So we start from this condition, where s goes to infinity, and t naught is some fixed number that satisfies this. In typically, there would be infinitely many t naughts. There would be some interval where this would be true. So starting from this condition, we can make an argu a contour argument. So let's write first an equation that's always true for t naught. So we do a small contour argument around some s prime. Okay, so this means that we have some contour which is very small around s prime. And I'm just writing the Cauchy theorem, okay? And then we have s prime t naught over s prime minus s. And then we have the s prime. So we pick some s and we do a small contour argument around uh, around s. So we have a contour that's centered at s and uh, the contour runs over s prime which is some contour like this. Okay. So this is a true equation because we assume that the, this function a has only poles on the real axis. So this is a true equation. We can choose a small enough contour that it would not include any of the other poles. 
But now, since this is true, since it decays at infinity for this particular T naught, we can deform this contour in an interesting way to pick up all the poles. So we can deform, imagine deforming this contour continuously to look like this. Okay? So you see that this can be deformed into this kind of thing. And since the amplitude vanishes at infinity, this allows us to write a s of t naught uh, as an integral over this minus this. The rest goes to zero because a goes to zero. And therefore, a over s goes to zero faster than one over s. So you don't pick up anything from infinity, but you pick up something from here minus here. Yes? I call it infinity? Yeah, so if, if the amplitude was of order one, then there would be a polyt infinity and then the argument uh, wouldn't work. But since I'm picking something out where it vanishes, then there is no polyt infinity. At least not the first order pole. There might be a second order pole, but we don't care. Or something of that sort, okay. I didn't hear the question very well, but you're asking what happens if I don't pull it all the way to infinity? Or what? Oh, but there isn't any polyt infinity. If there was a polyt infinity, this would pick up the polyt infinity plus the term that I'm about to write. You could try to, re to rerun the argument if there is a polyt infinity, but we know that if there is a polyt infinity, you won't be able to conclude there are infinitely many resonances because I just gave you a counterexample where there was just one resonance. Okay, so what if what dies off, like one of us? Oh, even better. No, because uh, this has a one over s in the denominator. You would get something that dies off like one over s squared, and therefore this uh, contour contribution would vanish. So as long as a dies off, it doesn't matter how fast, you don't pick up anything. Okay. So this can be written as a, an integral over the difference between the amplitude here and the amplitude here. What's the difference? The difference is called the imaginary part of A. And this integral is now over the real S prime is on the real axis now. Okay? Because we assume that all the poles are the real axis, so we just have to be careful around the real axis. Now, if you have a pole, the imaginary part that it induces is a delta function, okay? This is a fundamental equation that you should know. The imaginary part of the function s minus s naught is delta s minus s naught, okay? It's a fundamental equation that you need to know. Yeah, uh, there are no factors in this lecture. Or there one factors are omitted. Okay, this is a fundamental fact that you need to know. And so this can be and now written as so I can I can finish now uh, this little exercise with the following representation for s t naught is going to be a sum over all the resonances which are uh, picked up when you pick up these delta functions. So we have to sum over all the n's and l's, over all the possible resonances. And then in the top, we have some positive definite combinations of uh, Legendre polynomials of 1 plus 2t. Or m naught. And this fk are positive definite. So this is a representation uh, which you find to be true if this assumption is satisfied. So this representation makes sense for the amplitude. It looks like just a bunch of resonances that you've exchanged with some spins. Now, this function can, sorry, this is T naught. This function cannot be symmetric in T and S unless there are infinitely many 
pulse. Because this is a polynomial in T. Okay, so right, but T naught is some but you know T naught is some range of parameters. T naught is some finite region in the complex plane where uh, this condition is satisfied. Okay? Uh, and therefore this cannot be if this were true in some region of T naught, this could never be a symmetric function. It's a very simple argument, but you can push it very, very far, very far uh, for starting from here. You can prove that for every spin there are infinitely many particles. You can start to make estimates on what happens to the high resonances. So this is just the starting point, but uh, I think it's a good starting point. It's very simple, but it's a good starting point. So the conclusion is that this function, this cannot be symmetric. Symmetric in ST because it's a, because unless unless there are infinitely many poles. Why? Because if there were finitely many poles, the numerator, the fact, the dependence on T would be polynomial. There would be no singularities anywhere. Okay. So otherwise, polynomial in T. So if the theory is asymptotically free, this is known to be true. So there, has, there have to be infinitely many resonances. Fine, it's a simple result, but uh, it can be improved. It can be refined. Uh, OK, now I want to give you an example. This is the only example that we know of an amplitude that satisfies all of these constraints. This is the Veneziano amplitude, uh, which I'm going to write down. And I'll finish with an open question about the Veneziano amplitude that you could try to solve at home. So I'll go over time, five minutes. Uh, just want to make this point. So this is the only example of a function that is known to satisfy all of these constraints. The only example that we know, up to a tiny, tiny dressing that you can do uh, that, that appears in the heterotic string theory. So up to some tiny, tiny dressing that is allowed, this is the only known function that satisfies all of these constraints, which is amazing. There is only one. Okay. So let's analyze this function. Let's see how this, how this function works. Suppose we scatter not that young, but any, any amplitude of the That would also give you Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's true. So these axioms would be satisfied. Uh, so we have an infinite number of examples, right? Yeah, yeah, but they're all the same. I mean, it's... Uh, Basically, you just change these parameters here. Is that right? Yeah. That. Well, they're very, very, very similar. They're, they don't really give new examples. It's of the same sort. But what I wanted to what I wanted to emphasize what I wanted to emphasize is that a, this is a solution to these four constraints, but it hasn't been proven uh, that it is a solution. We just you can check it on the computer, but it hasn't been proven. And I think it would be really, really nice and potentially very important to try to prove that it satisfies the four constraints. So one constraint that's obvious is that it's symmetric in S and T. Uh, the other constraint that's obvious is there are only poles on the real axis. So let's fix T. The poles are at minus one. Yes, minus one, zero, one, two, all the way to infinity. So the, pole, the poles are at integer mass squares. Okay, so this is exactly linear. Uh, well, you don't see it yet, but the poles are on the real, the poles, the mass squares are just uh, integer numbers, and there is a tachyon. This guy means that some of, one of the mass squares is negative, so there is a tachyon. But nevertheless, you can proceed. Uh, yeah. What? Well, I don't, I, uh, you, you could, I mean, there are tiny, modifications of this function that also solve the constraints. But then you have a massless graviton. Here you just have a massless, uh, let's see. Hmm? Here you have a tachyon. But they're all the same. I just, it, it doesn't matter. This, this amplitude admits a little bit of modifications in the intercept and some tiny dressing factor that you can put. But they're all the same. These are not really different examples. So I'm just giving this one example for concreteness. So there are poles 
uh, on these numbers. This is where this function has pulse for any t, okay? And it does satisfy this constraint. It does satisfy this constraint. Uh, so starting from, I think that t naught here is minus one. So if t naught is smaller than minus one, if the real part of t naught is smaller than minus one, this is true. You can check. It's the Stirling formula. It follows from the Stirling formula. So everything is, this is obviously satisfied. The symmetry is obviously satisfied. The meromorphy is obviously satisfied. But nobody has ever proven that the residues are given by positive definite sums of Legendre polynomials. It's a fact of life. We just know it by putting this function on the computer to very high orders, but um, it hasn't been proven mathematically. And, it, and in fact, okay, so let me just explain what I, what I mean by that. So, so uh, let's, compute, let's compute the residue. I have it here. Okay, so the residue is given by, let me just think, so the, the residue at s equals n, where n is in minus one, zero, one, all the way to infinity, the residue for s equals n is given by a polynomial of order n plus one of t over, okay, so I already took the residue, so this would be a polynomial of order n plus one of t. It's some polynomial that you can compute by taking ratios of these gamma functions. And this polynomial, so the question is whether this polynomial of n plus one of t can be decomposed as a positive definite sum over Legendre polynomials that run from spin zero to spin n plus one. So in this Veneziano amplitude, there is a huge degeneracy, huge degeneracy that at a given pole, there are particles of spin zero, one, two, three, up to n plus one. So at the pole n, there are particles of spin up to n plus one. For example, at minus one, there is just a scalar. At zero, there is a vector. At one, there is a spin two. Okay, so there is a huge degeneracy. This is a property of this solution, which we don't expect from QCD. Uh, so the question is whether we can write this polynomial as a positive definite sum, a n l of a p l of one plus two t over a n plus four. Yeah, n plus four. Okay. And the question is whether the A and L are positive definite. Okay, so these polynomials are known. I can write them down. So let me just write down this polynomial. It's very simple. This polynomial is given by a t plus two, t plus three, times t plus three, all the way to t plus n plus two. Okay, this is what the polynomial is equal to. Uh, and the case of n equals, sorry, yes. And the case of n equals minus one, this polynomial is just one, okay? So the, so the polynomial for zero is just one. So it obviously satisfies everything. And for n plus one, where n is bigger than minus one, this is the answer. So you have to decompose this product in terms of Legendre polynomials of these arguments. And this is generally not known uh, you can check it on the computer that it works up to very high orders, but there is no proof. In fact, some of the coefficients become very, very small. If you go to very high orders, some of these coefficients remain positive. They never cross zero, but they become very, very, very small, exponentially small. So the fact that it's unitary is not obvious. It's not like there is a simple decomposition that we haven't discovered. Some of these coefficients do become very, very, very small when you go to very high little n. And they remain positive, but it seems that uh, there is some conspiracy that this works. Now, another fun, part, fun thing about this amplitude, this is the last thing that I'm mentioning and I'm done. This is the last fun fact. So these Legendre polynomials can be defined in any number of dimensions. They just become Gegenbauer polynomials. So PL can be extended to 
So PL mathematically can be understood as the zonal, zonal function of the group SOD minus one. And when D is equal to four, this is the Legendre polynomial. But if D is equal to 26 or any other D, then this is a Gegenbauer polynomial. So in general, we get Gegenbauer polynomial. Polynomials, Gegenbauer uh, polynomials. Now, Gegenbauer polynomials are known. They're just some, they can be obtained by some hypergeometric function that generates them all. And you can do a small exercise that's in my notes. In my lecture notes, you'll find the solution to this exercise, but you can also do it yourself. That if you take D that's bigger than 26, then A and L is not positive. Is not positive. That's a very fun fact, that this st stupid function knows about 26 dimensions. So this decomposition is positive for every number of dimensions that's smaller or equal to 26. But if you take d equals 27 at the second order, uh, meaning that at n equals 2, so I mean at, sorry, here. Hmm? Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> Good. Thank you so much. OK. so. Uh, what I wanted to say is that, uh, what, 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 this is what I, the last thing that I wanted to say. So the last thing that I wanted to say is that actually it doesn't fail at the zero order. You see, this is always a positive Gegenbauer polynomial. It doesn't fail at n equals zero, it fails here. So if you take d equals 27, the decomposition of this uh, quadratic polynomial would not have positive coefficients. So it fails when the polynomial is quadratic. Um, so, th and that's it, but for D26 and smaller, it just works. You can just put it on the computer and it works. But it hasn't been proven. So, uh, I think it would be very nice to directly prove that. It would teach us about why these functions exist, like we expect in QCD, or young mills theory, uh, how constrained these functions are. And I think a constructive proof would be useful because it might teach us how to modify the Venetiano amplitude. So the Venetiano amplitude has this crazy feature that there is a huge degeneracy in the masses. So for a given, for a given mass, there are many, many particles with different spins that have exactly the same mass. And this is the only solution that we know to these four constraints. But it, we don't expect this degeneracy in QCD. We know from Monte Carlo simulations that it doesn't exist. There is no such degeneracy in QCD. So maybe if we could understand why this is true, we could understand how to modify the Venetiano amplitude in a consistent way, so to preserve these four axioms, but remove this degeneracy. And then we can get closer to QCD. So this is a well-defined analysis that I think can be done, to look for consistent modifications of this function that remove the degeneracy. This can be set up as a perturbative exercise, uh, very far on the rigid trajectory, I think. So I think this is an interesting open problem that would be nice to solve. Let's sit them down.